Okay, so we're small, but we're good. And the um, plan today is to really discuss salmonella. And um, what, what I hope to do is we'll start off a little bit, probably with many of you know, with just sort of an overview of salmonella and generally some of the dogma and, um, and just general knowledge we have on salmonella. But then I want to sort of challenge things and shake it up a bit and um, sort of push the envelope with some of the things we found about salmonella recently and how it all um, pertains to the whole infectious process. Because there's been an awful lot of people who have studied salmonella for an awful long time. And um, what you'll see is they will really continue to find amazing things and really don't understand this organism all that well still. So obviously, the, the concept is we'll talk about salmonella and its, its interactions with the host. And one of the concepts I want to drive across is depending where the organism is, you really have different kinds of disease and different kinds of interactions with the host. So just to remind us again, salmonella, um, it's a foodborne infection. Really, there's two flavors of, of infections in people. There's the systemic typhoid-type fever that you see mainly in developing countries. And then there's the non-typhoidal salmonella, the gastroenteritis, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea that you see pretty much around the world, the food poisoning um, type salmonella. And you can see the numbers here. Obviously, this still plays a major um, role in morbidity and mortality worldwide. And compounding this is the incredible levels of antibiotic and drug resistance in salmonella throughout the world. So it's a, a, a continues to remain a major problem in terms of foodborne infections. So salmonella, as it says, foodborne. You get it orally, um, ingest contaminated food or water, and then it goes down to the small bowel intestine, where the bacterium then penetrates, probably through M cells and other cells, into the underlying. Um, phagocytic cells, macrophages, and it can cause intestinal problems or it can then go on and distribute more um, systemically um, as it moves along. So um, we, we know that salmonella has the capacity to penetrate the intestinal epithelium. There's been a lot of work done in this area over many labs over the years, interact with the um, immune system, both innate and acquired, and then it basically drains in the mesenteric lymph nodes, and there it can go systemic even into the bone marrow as well as the spleen and the liver, and they can then go down the liver into the gallbladder. We'll say more about this in this talk later. And then can this can then lead to reseeding of the organism in the feces, and then shedding, and then recontamination of other people. So salmonella has historically been considered an intercellular organism. It has the capacity to enter into mammalian cells. So if you have the intestinal epithelium here, the bacterium can um, somehow interact, and we really don't know a lot of this process yet, trigger events in the mammalian cell, so it then extends these pseudopods up and around, embraces the bacterium, and then internalizes the bacterium into a membrane-bound vacuole. Now, some bacteria get in and break out of this vacuole, but salmonella remains in this membrane-bound occlusion where it can either transit through the cell or live in here and replicate, always remaining within this membrane-bound vacuole. So salmonella targets phagocytic cells. Um, this is an experience we did many, many years ago where we wanted to see what kind of cells it was actually targeting the liver and the spleen. And basically, it turns to um, macrophages and also neutrophils. And so the yellow is stained salmonella. And you can see this heavy infiltrate of macrophages and then neutrophils to the site of the infection. And there's actually a raging controversy in the literature for a long time whether salmonella was truly an intracellular organism or whether it was just um, hanging out um, in, in the vicinity of these cells. And um, I think we sort of finally answered that with basically the invention of confocal microscopy. And we were then able to do cross sections of in vivo infected cells with salmonella. And the moral of this story is here's salmonella in orange, the macrophage um, in green. No matter how you slice this thing, the bacteria is truly inside these cells. The reason the controversy exists is people had been doing electron microscopy, but because they had to use such high doses to see any bacteria, people were saying that was artificial. And with these high doses, there were a lot of bacteria outside the cell as well. So it really, we really believe it does live inside cells, um, um, both phagocytic and non-phagocytic. So there's been an awful lot done on how salmonella um, gets into cells and causes effect in cells. And I, I think we all generally know that that's due to these type 3 secretion systems. And these are specialized secretion systems that span the bacterial membrane that have the capacity to deliver molecules we call effectors into host cells. And these have been heavily studied, many gram-negative pathogens. And it really gives the bacteria a really nice mechanism to drive bacterial molecules into mammalian cells to reprogram it. 
Well, in the case of salmonella, it's been well known for a long time now, there's actually two type 3 secretion systems. So it has two ways of getting bacterial proteins into cells. And generally, it's thought that this first one, called salmonella pathogens island 1, or SPI1, is involved in the uptake of the bacterium into the intestinal epithelium. So this is the initial stage of the event, where it can then um, pump molecules in that triggers um, basically invasion and entry into epithelial cells. This event also seems to deliver effectors that involve in the early events of gastrointestinal inflammation. So when we think of salmonella and gastroenteritis, we generally think of this by one system. And the dogma in the field sort of suggests that this evolved first, it got the bacterium into cells, but then once you're inside cells, you have to figure out how you're going to survive inside these cells. And it then acquired a second type 3 system, this thing called the SPI2 system. And like SPI1, it delivers molecules, but different molecules in the mammalian cell. And work over the years in our lab, David Holden's lab, and many others have shown that this system seems to be involved in the bacteria surviving inside phagocytic cells, macrophages, et cetera. And it's thought to be involved in the systemic type of disease, so the, um, the later events seen in typhoid fever, et cetera. So the dogma says it's gastroenteritis for SPI1 and then systemic diseases such as typhoid fever for SPI2. So we, we've learned a lot over the years, and I'm not going to detail this because I think we're all pretty much aware of this, though, that salmonella has this type, SPI1 type system. SPI1 um, basically delivers effectors that basically interface with the act in the cytoskeleton and cause major cytoskeletal events, ultimately internalize the bacterium and big act in the cytoskeletal rearrangements to get the bacterium inside the cell. Once it's inside the cell, what salmonella does is it basically disrupts the normal trafficking of the cell. So it um, basically blocks fusion with the lysosome. So you have a salmonella-containing vacuole that goes in here. It has markers of the early endosome, but then it basically blocks the later events, the maturation, as it would normally, endosomes normally progress down this pathway, it blocks it. Now, remarkably, it also triggers these tubule structures here that are um, called salmonella-induced filaments or SIFs which we discovered many, many years ago now, and these are somehow involved in the bacteria replicating inside the cell. So the bottom line is it uses its SPI2 systems to basically block the delivery to what would be normally toxic lysosomes to survive. And that's kind of reiterated here too, and um, as you can see, we've, we know less about the SPI2 system. You can see all the question marks here about some of the yellow salmonella effectors and what they're doing, and um, really I think this is a, um, a more poorly understood um, type 3 effector system than the SPI1 system, which, which Glenn and others have, have really worked out. So what we started to realize over the years is these SPI2 system, their effectors play a key role in salmonella inside these cells, and um, the molecule that triggers the, these salmonella-induced filaments, these things, is an effector called CFA, and um, many of the SPI2 effectors end up accumulating on the vacuolar membrane around salmonella, where they seem to have effects. Although others are seen to be able to go distally and then trigger other effects in the, um, in the target in these cells. So this is kind of an overview of what we know about the SPI2 system. And the bottom line is it really does disrupt the programming of the cell. It goes to great um, lengths to really muck up many aspects of the vesicular trafficking system and even cytoskeleton involved in there. And many of the SPI2 effectors um, have particular roles in affecting this inside cells. Uh, what, what I'd like to point out is that really most of this, and pretty much all of it, has been worked out in, in tissue culture cells, in vitro, as we call it here. And um, really how this pertains to the whole salmonella biology, I think, is still really under, understudied. And, and that's sort of shown here. This is a list of um, known salmonella type 3 spy 2 effectors that we know are injected into mammalian cells. And we've been able to, uh, well, not we, um, the field has been able to assign functions to um, our labs being involved in several of these, but others not, um, to some of these things. But you can see there's several of these things. We just don't have a clue what they're actually doing inside the host cell yet. Not only do we not know what, um, what they're not doing, we also think that there's probably other SPI2 effectors that we don't know yet that might be involved in this process. So that led us on a hunt. So could we identify pretty much all the salmonella SPI2 effectors so we knew what we had to deal with? And um, this is work that was done by um, Sigrid Ottweiler and Amit Bafshar in the lab. This actually just, just came out recently. And the idea was, well, let's do proteomics on the SPI2 secreted proteins and identify all the proteins that, that are secreted by this type 3 system. 
And so we do that, we basically use this, this proteomic differential labeling technique called SILAC, um, stable isotope labeled amino acids in cell culture, which is really just a fancy technology for growing your bacteria or your mammalian cells in two different media, one that labels the lysines and arginine with heavy isotopes and one that labels them with light. So you get two populations. The trick is to, do, to take these two populations, which in this case are going to be differing. This is a SPI2 secretion system, so there's no SPI2 secreted proteins here. This is wild type. You then take the supernates in this case, and then you basically pool all these things and run them through mass spec. And because of the differences in the mass, you can then determine um, the masses of the various things. And if the masses, the ratio of the two masses are one, basically that means it's secreted under equal conditions here and here. But um, if the ratios are different, and if they're higher, say, in the wild type versus this one, it means there's more in this than this. That hints that maybe because the SPI3 is knocked out, um, this SPI2 type 3 is knocked out, maybe it's a SPI2 secreted protein. So we did this, and it actually worked really, really well, because this is um, basically the list of all the all the proteins that have a high ratio being secreted in wild type compared to the type 3 mutant. And you can see we analyzed all these things here. And generally speaking, a ratio over 2 is, is kind of the noise cutoff level they use in these studies. And you can see tracking on here that um, um, here's, here's one protein that's known to be secreted by the, the type 3 system. And the one, and um, I'm sorry, one protein that's not known actually was ribosome protein here, and then all the known SPI2 effectors. The neat thing is we identified all the known SPI2 effectors that we'd found, and we found a whole bunch more that um, we then went on to actually study this. So as I said, this just, just came out, and I don't want to um, go into too much detail, and you can, you can check the paper here, but here's the list of the proteins that are basically secreted preferentially by wild type compared to a SPI2 mutant. And you can recognize many of the SPI2 effectors in here, as well as others that we're now chasing down to, to try and confirm whether or not they're actually a SPI2 dependent system. So what you find hits, you then have to do additional studies to prove whether it's not secreted by SPI2. Usually put a tag on it and try it in wild type versus SPI2 mutant. So anyway, I think we're getting much closer to identifying what is the repertoire that salmon health and SPI has in terms of SPI2 effectors. And then having that, then the hard work begins, because now we've got to figure out what each one of these things does and how it affects the host cell. So in these days of systems biology, one is always thinking of ways of trying to figure out what the heck do all these things do. And Michelle Buchner is a grad student in the lab. She basically took all the known spike tube mutants before we just did that study and um, basically made a mutation in each one of these things. And the idea was to systematically compare them all at one time through a bunch of different screens. And the reason we wanted to do this is most of us in the field usually pick, on, say, pick one, one effector and then we work through what it does, but we never compare it to the others. And we felt that, well, we're going to have to bite the bullet and systematically define what do all these SPI2 um, effectors do. So Michelle made all these mutants, and we started screening. One of the easy screens you can do is measure the replication inside cultured epithelial cells, HeLa, and I'm also not showing CACA2 cells. And based on what we knew, you'd predict that SPI2 would not have an effect in salmonella um, replication in these cells because they're epithelial cells, and we didn't expect to see any effect, and the bottom line is we didn't. So SPI2 doesn't affect replication in epithelial cells. We already knew that because this is a SPI2 mutant here compared to wild type, and they're the same. Okay. But well, what happens when you throw in macrophages? Well, there's where things heated up a bit. And so obviously, if you take a wild type versus a SPI2 mutant, you can see the SPI2 mutant is basic, can't divide inside macrophages. So that argues that some of the things being secreted by SPI2 are needed for replication in salmonella. So you can see the starred ones here seem to have an effect. And based on a bunch of studies that Michelle had done, we've now been able to identify which effectors we think are key for replicating in these macrophages. Some were known, some weren't, and you can see them listed up here. So I think the moral of the story right here, um, you see, is that obviously several effectors are involved in this, this macrophage replication, but not all of them. So obviously, these things probably have other roles, um, or, um, or we're just not seeing the effects inside cultured mouse macrophages, which you could argue might be a little artificial. OK, what happens when you turn to the animal? Well, again, um, Michelle. Um, did this and looked in the spleen, the liver, the mesenteric lymph nodes. And first of all, you can see in all cases, when you compare the wild type for the SPI2 mutant, SPI2 mutants die. They basically can't live after five days inside these organs, and that's what we expected here. But what you see is there's some effects by um, some of the um, type 3 effectors, 
but many of them don't have pronounced effects in terms of this long-term survival inside these animals. Um, we expected to, to find these two here because it was reported in literature that they were important, and sure enough, they were. Um, but really, we couldn't come up with profound, severe phenotypes with many of these others. And that's not surprising, because that's a theme we see a lot of the time with, um, with all these type 3 effectors, when they have repertoires of, say, 40-plus proteins. Um, many of the times, you can't see um, strong phenotypes for, for a number of reasons, perhaps redundancy, um, duplication, or um, the other reason is that they probably all work together. We just knock one out. Um, you haven't really disrupted the system enough to see an obvious phenotype. But anyway, that sort of gave us an overview of, of, of the, all the different spike 2 effectors that we knew at that time um, and what they actually might contribute to disease. Okay, so now I want to turn to the concept of sort of, let's talk about salmonella dog and what's known, and I want to show you that basically I think we kind of got it wrong a little bit, and, um, and maybe we need to rethink how we actually think about salmonella. So when salmonella comes in orally, it's acquired, it's ingested, it's then able to penetrate the intestinal epithelium. And I've just told you the invasion of these cells and everything is really dependent on the SPI1 type 3 system. And we know that, there's data to show it and everything. Then the idea is that the infection then progresses a bit more, the bacterium goes um, systemic, gets in the reticular endothelial system, goes to the liver and the spleen, and so this time the SPI2 system really kicks in. Everyone says, including us, that SPI2 is later in this whole um, scheme of things. And that's wherever you read textbooks, reviews will all tell you this. So Brian Coombs was an MD-PhD student in the lab, and um, he was involved heavily in the um, early work when we were trying to set up a gastroenteritis type model in, in the mice. And um, he and others showed that if you pretreated these mice with antibiotics by shifting the microbiota, instead of, getting a instead of getting a typhoid type disease, you actually get gastroenteritis or um, a diarrheal type disease in animals. Very different disease. And um, so he was looking at this type of system and he set this up. And one of the first things is, well, I wonder what happens in SPI1 and SPI2 mutants. Now, you predict SPI1 mutants be affected because this is a gastroenteritis disease, and that should have a profound effect, and that's what he saw. He also developed a pathology scoring system, I should add, that basically is a way of scoring disease, which was kind of a new addition to our lab, being a molecular biology lab, of actually scoring disease-type symptoms so we could actually measure disease. Well, what he found, first of all, he confirmed that if you compare wild-type versus a SPI1 mutant. So this has no SPI1 type 3 secretion. You can see this has severe disease, big um, swelling, fluid, infiltrate, et cetera. Compared to the SPI1, this is what normal looks like. So basically, it's attenuated. And that made sense. That's what the literature said. But what he noticed is that the SPI2, there's still, this is not nearly as sick as the wild type. So if you knock out the SPI2 system, and remember, this is early. This is um, diarrheal type things. We're seeing an effect of the SPI2 system here. And you can also quantitate that um, histologically. Of course, wild type has a lot of disease. SPI1 mutant um, doesn't really have much disease at all. But look how decreased SPI2 is. In all cases, SPI2 is quite a bit lower um, than, the, um, than the wild type. So that's weird, because we didn't expect SPI2 to have any effect in the, um, in the, in the gastroenteritis type aspects of this disease. And that was the first real um, warning light we had, that SPI2 may be doing something that we previously didn't appreciate. So to complement that, we started to look at the expression of SPI2. And I've already told you SPI2 should be on late. So we would expect to be on really late in the infection, you know, days into the infection when it, um, rather than early in the, in the um, event. So Nat Brown was a postdoc in the lab at the time. And what he did is he set up a system of measuring when do promoters go on when you add these bacteria to animals. And this is something called Rivet, which is a technology that allows you to have a, a marker here flanked by these resolve sites. And then you take your um, promoter of interest and you clone a resolve ease downstream of it. And if this promoter goes on, the resolve ease comes on, it kicks this out of here, and then you lose this marker. So you can plate the loss of this marker. So this, and this is a really good way of, of figuring out when these promoters go on. So the first thing we did was take a SPI2 promoter and then add SPI2 to macrophages. And we found that if it didn't go into macrophages, the SPI2 gene was not on. When it went in, it resolved, and it then um, went on. So that, that makes sense. SPI2 comes on deep inside cells um, at later in the events. But what Nat did was then um, have a look at what happens actually in, in the animals. And we started five days into it, SPI2 was on. OK, that makes sense. Three days, two days, one day, SPI2 was on. 
Then we started to get desperate because we really didn't think it would be on that quickly, and that started marching backwards time-wise. And by 15 minutes, 80% of the spike 2 promoter was on after we added the bacteria to these animals. And that was bizarre because we just spike 2 should not be on that early in, in these various organs. So it comes on as fast as basically as soon as we can detect it, spike 2 is already on in here. And that goes against everything we sort of had thought about SPI2. Um, and we also showed that, um, that um, uh, SPI2 regulator is involved in this resolution. If you knock this out, of course, it can't come on. And on pars and other regulators seem to have an effect. So that started to question, well, if it's on at 15 minutes, salmonella is not even inside cells at 15 minutes. Um, what's actually happening? So the lab then had a look at where salmonella was at 15 minutes, and you could see the bacteria lined up here. So they're outside cells. Here's the intestinal epithelium here. And, um, and they all seem to be outside cells. Oops. Um, yet at this time, the, the, basically, they're, they're resolved. So then we even took a spy one mutant, which says you can't get into cells, and looked at the promoter. And again, basically, even though they're not getting into cells, so this is an in vein type through spy one knockout. They shouldn't get into cells. Yet SPI2 is on. And that was um, very different than what we expected in the whole SPI2 regulation. So to confirm it, at the time, um, we, we turned to another animal model that's used to measure gastroenteritis, and that's a, um, a, a bovine loop model. And um, Brian Coombs involved in this. And up until the mouse model, this was really the only model for studying the um, role of salmonella and gastroenteritis. These cows get gastroenteritis. Um, and um, you then just basically measure the fluid that accumulates in these loops. And of course, you've put in wild type, you get big fluid accumulation. And if you get a spy one mutant, of course, you get a decrease in fluid. But look at this. We're seeing a decrease also in the fluid accumulation in a spy two mutant. And that was very perplexing, but um, the data overwhelmingly basically always told us that spy two played a big role in the fluid secretion in the early events of gastroenteritis. So based on um, all those studies, we've now compiled a lot of evidence to argue that we kind of need to re re rethink how we think SPI2 works. And the concept that, no, it's just way late, long, long inside the organs and everything. And we now know SPI2, whatever it's doing, whatever these effectors are doing, are actually kicking on very early, as soon as inside the intestine, even before it gets into cells. And um, it's getting ready to do whatever these SPI2 things are doing. And it's needed for the whole gastroenteritis type um, aspects of the infection. Okay, I'm now going to really switch gears, and we're going to talk about Crohn's disease. And you're probably saying, this is a talk on salmonella. Why are we talking about Crohn's disease, which is an inflammatory bowel disease? But hang in there, because I think, I think you'll start to see what, what I'm getting at. So just to remind you, Crohn's disease, it's an inflammatory bowel disease. It's a really awful, severe intestinal inflammatory type disease. Um, this is the lifetime risk of acquiring it. And a major complication of Crohn's, the most major complication of Crohn's, is they develop what's called fibrosis and strictures. Basically, the intestine gets really um, stiff and um, often has it really cut out by surgery. You can see the surgical removal of these parts of the bowel. And these can then um, redevelop these strictures. And this is just an awful aspect of Crohn's disease. So the, the intestinal fibrosis has been known for a long time. Maybe you can see the, the effects on the um, intestinal cell here. And basically, it's a huge deposition of collagen um, produced by these fibroblasts, myofibroblasts, that lay down all this collagen that, that, that causes this. And the problem with this is that um, it obviously causes severe things. But the other problem is, in this whole field, is there's, there's virtually no mouse models. You, well, the only model is basically um, inject these chemicals into the intestine of these animals every day, and maybe once in a while you get some that develop these um, strictures, but it's very irreproducible. And really, studying this whole concept of this um, fibrosis has been very difficult in, these, um, in most models, and because of that, that's hindered the understanding of how this actually works. So going back to Salmonella, to, to try and tie these two things together, Guntram Grassel was a postdoc in the lab, and he was looking at, he decided, well, let's look at longer times of Salmonella, really um, um, longer times um, in terms of days and what's actually happening in the intestine. Now, in Salmonella, there's two kinds of mice, those that will die within a week, or those that we call resistant and, then, and, and live and don't, um, and don't die. So obviously, for these kinds of experiments, we have to use the um, resistant animals, those that have the NRAMP gene that won't kill the, the salmonella. And that way you can study long-term intestinal inflammation. 
So the idea is to use the gastrointestinal models. We pretreat with antibiotics. And then we're just going to follow over time what happens in the intestinal um, inflammation. And we're going to quantitate a whole bunch of different ways. And one thing we saw is that the, the salmonella causes this chronic inflammation over a long time period, 40 days plus. Um, one of the readouts of disease is basically to measure how shrunken the cecum is. The more shrunk it is, the more disease you have. So you can um, measure um, basically even just the weight of the cecum. Um, here, here's a, a nice, normal, healthy cecum. You can see these are very small and shriveled, and they have much decreased weight over time. That tells us this is sort of a chronic inflammatory type disease from the salmonella point of view, and it lasts many, many days. Well, then um, they, um, it was Guntram and Yannette Valdez was in the lab. They noticed these, these really hard, funny things. And Bruce Valence, who's another colleague of ours, happened to be in the lab and said, have you ever stained for collagen? And um, Yannette and, and Guntram really hadn't thought about this. But um, Bruce, working in the inflammatory bowel um, area, had, 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 was already thinking of this. And so they then started to stand, stain for collagen. And what they found is there's this massive depositions of collagen of these things, um, both low mag and high magnification. There's this huge collagen deposition. Looks very much like the strictures and the fibrosis structures you see um, in, in Crohn's disease. Um, you can actually look at the upregulation of the collagen genes, and salmonella, 21 days into it, causes a massive upregulation. It's hard to see here. Um, massive upregulation of collagen genes, and, um, and you can also measure the inflammatory cytokines. Let's get to here. And what we found is that this looks a heck of a lot like what you see during, um, um, during Crohn's disease. So you can measure various inflammatory cytokines 21 days after the infection, and here's you can see the, the correlation in our model with those that are involved in inflammatory bowel disease. And the ones in reds are the ones we actually measured. Huge correlation. So it seems like we've sort of got a chronic intestinal inflammatory model that mimics Crohn's disease, including the intestinal um, fibrosis and the collagen deposition. Salmonella also induced the um, production of, of prophibiotic cytokines. These are associated with triggering cells to produce collagen uh, and deposition. And like we um, had hoped, we saw that. And we also saw cells that are involved in depositing collagen and fibrosis um, come down onto these things. And there's a huge, you can stain by this vimentin, which is a marker for these things. And these collagen deposition cells are found in large numbers in these chronic inflammatory intestinal areas. Um, salmonella, for its part, well, that's hard to see, is um, basically it's found, you can see the salmonella here, it's found really in the lumen of these things. We don't see it um, deep intestinally. It seems to be sort of on the surface where it's triggering this inflammation. We don't see it deep in the tissues. It seems to be mainly in the lumen um, in these infected areas. But it's kind of like this, you know, a piece of sand in the oyster causing this intense inflamm inflammation and irritation in this, triggering these whole events. We had a look at what the type 3 systems are, and we found that both SPI1 and SPI2 are needed for this. And if you have mutants in both SPI1 and SPI2, you have um, less, um, less type effects in, in here. So they contribute to this whole process. That makes sense because you need this long-term intestinal inflammation um, happening. Now, if we're going to develop a good model for fibrosis, you have to use it in mice that people can make knockouts in. And so we, um, and most of them use an, um, a type of mouse that's NRAM sensitive. So we then developed the model um, using uh, basically a, a slightly attenuated salmonella. This is a live attenuated salmonella that doesn't kill um, mice. It's also used as a vaccine strain. And in, if you use this strain in these mice, and so the mice don't die, you still see the intense inflammatory type effects. I'm going with this and um, you get large collagen deposition. And what this has now done is allowed this model to be extended to various knockout animals to start to probe the role of various inflammatory pathways, et cetera, in this type of um, disease. So um, this has actually turned out to be um, really useful from the gastrointestinal point of view because they really didn't have a good mouse model for Crohn's until they come along. And um, the gastrointestinal people have embraced this, although I get all these funny phone calls from gastroenterologists, like, how do I grow salmonella? You mean you want me to infect animals um, to do this? Um, but we give them the airway vaccine strains, so it's a vaccine strain, so they're not going to hurt themselves doing it. Um, but it's now being embraced by many labs, and it turns out it's actually a really, really nice system to um, study um, fibrosis, which is, which is the big, big problem in Crohn's. 
what it has to do with salmonella pathogenesis. It's a good model to study chronic inflammation, um, although there's no literature that we can find on salmonella triggering fibrosis in humans doing long-term inflammation. Okay, so we talked about the SPI-1, the SPI-2, they're all those effects and all the effectors they're having in cells. I now want to talk about an area that, that um, is a hallmark of salmonella typhoid, um, but really hasn't received much um, research attention. And this goes all the way back to Mary Malone, also known as Typhoid Mary. She was this um, Irish cook in New York, and she basically um, shed salmonella typhi from her gallbladder into her feces, and one wonders about her cooking ability, but that then led to the contamination of other people, and a lot of people um, died of typhoid fever because of her. Um, she was incarcerated twice, and basically the second time they um, locked her up and put her on an island in New York for the rest of her life, and she refused to have her gallbladder removed, and she basically shed transiently her whole life. Um, they were very hard on her. You can see they depicted her. Um, back, this is... Um, Back in this era, women didn't usually have hairy faces. They didn't usually have double chins. They didn't have hair in their arms. And so this was actually one of a newspaper editorial cartoon of this woman um, doing this. She swore she'd never have typhoid fever. And um, it's a very interesting story in terms of public health measures. The first time people were locked up um, for public health reasons. But anyway, she sheds typhi. And the question is, well, how does she shed typhi? Well, it's shed out of the gallbladder. And... Um, the gallbladder is basically between the liver and the, and the intestine. It's where um, bile salts are concentrated, and it's really a little sac. There's a cross section through it here that, that's full of bile. And then when you eat, etc., bile is, is delivered down this, the bile duct into the intestine, and it then basically aids in the digestion. So it's a little sac that stores um, um, bile. It's also thought to be where salmonella can hang out and, um, and basically cause this carrier status. So in terms of what's known in gallbladder salmonella, it's known that salmonella typhi, um, patients can have um, salmonella typhi in their gallbladder, both acute and um, chronic type patients. It's well known in the gallbladders of rabbits in the early 1900s that the bacteria can persist in the gallbladder. And um, Denise Monak showed a few years ago that sometimes you can test the gallbladder of mice in, a, in her persistence model. And um, there's reports in literature that there's changes in the gallbladder um, during typhoid um, fever. Um, a lot of times there, there's um, basically disease in the gallbladder. And it's thought that this sort of serves as the way of seeding the bacteria into the, um, from the liver into the bile and then causing shedding. But the problem was that, really, we didn't know anything about it. They, we had this literature um, telling us these things, but we really didn't know. There's no data on um, you know, salmonella infections of the gallbladder and how it worked, what it might be doing. So um, the idea was, well, let's see if we can't set up a model. And this is set up by Ellen Arena, who's now in the Philippe's lab, and Alfredo Menendez, who was um, a postdoc in the lab at the time. And the idea is to take mice and really give them infections, then we'll just collect tissues at various time points. I started this just as a project to see where salmonella was going in the mice at all organs, including gallbladder. And they harvested these things and then just had to look at where the bacteria counts were. And when you, you basically fractionate a mouse and you look where salmonella counts come, in the early times, six hours after infection, they're mainly in the liver and the spleen and the kidney, and um, there's a little bit of a dip. And then there's a log scale here. You can see they go up and up and up in the liver and the spleen until 120 hours into these things. Well, when you start looking at the gallbladder, you start to see a few bacteria by 48 hours. But by 120 hours, the number of bacteria per, per gram of tissue is basically greater than that found in the liver and the spleen. There's a lot of salmonella in these gallbladders. And so that then led Ellen and Alfredo to think, well, maybe there's something to be had here, and let's have a look at what actually goes on in the gallbladder. So when they started to look in these things, you could see salmonella both inside cells here, um, inside cells here, and also extracellular bacteria. You'd expect to see them given the high numbers of salmonella that are present um, in, in, in this organ. And again, just to remind you, this is what a normal healthy gallbladder looks like. You can see nice fingers pointing out. And this is basically filled with bile. When you infect with salmonella, all heck breaks loose, and these poor gallbladders get extremely diseased. And you can see here's four gallbladders in four different animals showing um, severe infiltrate and also very destruction of the whole structure of these things. And um, large disease infiltrate, et cetera, here. <clears throat> 
So when they started to look closely where salmonella is, they found it didn't translocate in the deep tissue. It seems to be on the mucosal surface. And um, it's hard to see here, but this is the apical surface of the cells. And down on the basolateral surface, they started to see a lot of the salmonella. But they were just hanging there. They weren't going um, um, penetrating deeper than this. Now, we started to look, well, are they inside cells? And they localize with various markers. And LAMP1 is a marker that stains lysosomal glycoproteins. And um, so normally there's a nucleus here, and the LAMP one's up in the apical surface here. When you affect with salmonella, all the LAMP one up here disappears, and it all traffics to the salmonella, which was the basal lateral surface of these things. So there's a big rearrangement in the vesicular structures in these cells, and LAMP one then targets to the salmonella. And this is a big indication, probably, that the salmonella are inside cells in these LAMP one positive um, areas. Um, and here's another um, section that, that Ellen um, showed. You can see all the salmonella just all along the edges here, basically um, at the basal lateral surface of these cells. And um, you can see, see it more here. Um, you can see the green is the actin. You can see the apical surface up here. Look at all the salmonella all along the basal lateral surface of these things. Um, um, basically in the, in the lumen of the gallbladder, but the opposite end. And the reason this is weird is that in intestinal epithelium, in the intestine, salmonella is always at the apical surface. And there's no other cell types being reported where salmonella hangs out at the opposite end of these cells at the basolateral surface. And then with Wayne Vogel, we had a look electron microscopically what's going on. And again, you can see the bacteria are way down. At, here's the apical surface, way down at the basolateral surface. Lots of bacteria inside vacuoles, probably lamp-containing vacuoles, and um, even replicating inside vacuoles here. Down at the bottom of these cells, and they seem to persist here. And this is where they then replicate and live inside these cells. They seem to replicate. You can find pictures of the bacteria seem to be dividing in these vacuoles. Um, and much like you see in other epithelial cells, except, as I emphasize, they're underneath there, the basolateral surface, instead of the apical surface where they normally, in other epithelial cells, hang out. So a question we had is, sam can salmonella grow in bile itself? Bile is a salt. It's a basically a detergent, several, and it's um, thought to be, you know, it degrades food, and there's ideas that degrade bacteria, et cetera. So they had looked, can salmonella grow in concentrated bile? So they um, got hold of some bile, and they then basically added it as a, as a growth media. And what they found is that um, salmonella grew just fine inside bile. Um, as well as an L broth, and it grows just fine here. And didn't, not, salmonella doesn't grow very well in PBS. So not only does it survive inside bile, it actually uses a growth medium to live inside um, these gallbladders. So bile is definitely not antibacterial for salmonella. So to put, to put the whole gallbladder story together is that we know the gallbladder is heavily colonized by salmonella. It seems to go to the basal lateral surface and hang out there. Um, you can see the other um, things here. And it seems to trigger major infiltration of, of neutrophils in there. And um, so it seems to be a really neat but different system to study salmonella biology because all of us until now have been really studying salmonella either in macrophages or in intestinal epithelial cells um, during the gastrointestinal type phases. And so this opens up studies in the area of carriage and um, dissemination, and then which obviously plays a major role in the salmonella typhi biology of the disease. So one of the things we noticed is that salmonella seemed in the gallbladder seemed to cause the accumulation of things called lipid droplets. These are these little things here. There's one here and one here, a few more um, around in here. When you infect with salmonella compared to the uninfected one. And that led Ellen and then Sigu Otwar in the lab to then start to have a closer look at this. This is a really rather bizarre phenotype. So if you're like me, the first thing you say is, what is a lipid droplet? I didn't know what a lipid droplet was, but luckily Ellen and Sigu told me. And basically these, are, um, basically these are intracellular stores for neutral lipids. And these sort of balls are formed. We put the lipids in the middle. You surround them by a phospholipid bilayer around the outside. And you then um, accumulate these things, and you can then um, um, basically keep these things inside cells. They also had a look to see what happens in their suggested role in pathogenesis because we were seeing them in the salmonella affected cells and not other cells. And there's some hints in the literature of some organisms um, um, involved in this, but there really wasn't very much. So I'm now going to tell you the story of the identification of salmonella spike 2 effector that basically seems to be involved in triggering this lipid formation. 
And to do that, I have to go back to our um, proteomic screen, the SILAC technology. Again, remember that's that heavy and light labeling. But instead of labeling bacteria this time, we're labeling tissue culture cells. So the mammalian cells are being labeled. And in one, um, in one um, basically extract mammalian cells, we've got a tagged by two effectors. You'll see it's this molecule called SSEL, for example. And the other, um, basically, is just the standard HA tag alone. And the idea is to immunoprecipitate with this tagged effector versus the tag of this light and heavy type media, pool the samples, do mass spec again, and look for those that have differential um, labeling um, ratios that are um, very different than the standard ratio of one. Um, so SIGI was and admit we're doing this, and the bottom line is we, we did this on pretty much all the SPI2 effectors. The idea was we wanted to find binding partners for them. I'm not going to go through all of them. The studies just now come out where we, um, first of all, we confirmed all the known SPI2 effectors, what they bind to in mammalian cells of the ones that were known. So that was good. It means the technology works. Plus, we found some new ones, and you can see um, some of them listed here. It was a bit disappointing because many we couldn't identify binding partners to. Um, but for the ones we did find partners, we, we seem to be able to confirm these things, and they seem to be real. So we're, we're happy with that. So um, the one we focused on is, is this, this one here, just for the sake of this story, because I'm telling you about these um, lipid droplets. This is a SPI2 effector called SSEL. And it turns out it bound this protein called oxysterol binding protein, OSPP. This is a host protein, and um, it's thought to bind oxysterols. So that might be a clue in terms of lipid. It's involved in vesicular trafficking. Maybe that involves lipids. Sphingomyelin synthesis, cholesterol metabolism, all things that might be involved in lipid droplet formation. Um, in terms of SSEL, we knew it was a SPI2 effector. The mutant was mildly attenuated. Um, and others had shown that it had this deubiquitinase activity. Basically, um, it removes ubiquitin from various things. All the substrate of whatever gets deubiquitinated de was really not known. OK, so SPI2 effector binds this OSBP. Um, what does that do? Well, the first thing Siggy did was to prove this interaction was real. We showed it once on proteomics. Again, I don't want to go through the details of this plot. The bottom line is that um, if you pull down with OSPP, you pull down the tagged SSEL. And if you do the reciprocal experiment, pull down SSEL, you pull down OSPP. So that confirmed the proteomics. These things do tend to bind. At, um, and the proteomics was telling us what well, we think was telling us the, the right thing. So then what happens? Where does OSBP go? Once so we had a look where um, we couldn't see it in these cells, and, um, and we basically started staying for OSBP. And it's a little bit hard to see, but here's salmonella here. You can see this OSBP label seems to um, co-localize with salmonella. It's really hard to see uh, up here, but on the screen, it's quite strong. You can see OSBP seems to be co-localizing in the area of salmonella, again, here versus here. So oh, actually, maybe you'll see it better on the merges up here. So there was co-localization. So that's kind of guilt by proximity, the fact that OSVP is, um, is co-localized near where salmonella does. Um, this is just more of the same, just again, um, proving that bacteria seems to co-localize with OSVP. And this is in gallbladder. So that's good. It means it's co-localizing. So OK, if OSVP, if SSEL is affecting things and, and OSVP is needed, the odds are that if we um, basically downregulate OSBP um, in the host cell, maybe that'll affect salmonella replication. So SIGI used siRNA. In this case, we, um, um, basically wild type um, scrambled um, siRNA, basically salmonella replicates like this. And then when you knock down OSBP, replication goes down. So that argues that OSBP is involved in it. And if you transfect in more OSBP into cells, you get an increase in salmonella replication. OK, that's all shaping up nicely. Well, we did one experiment too many. It's always the case in science. So OK, if SSCL is needed for it, you predict that SSCL, if you took a, um, a mutant, um, that should, should disrupt the whole thing. And this is where the wheels fell off, unfortunately, and for whatever reason, that um, when we mutated SSCL, which was binding OSPP, we thought we'd, um, it would alleviate the effect. It didn't. Salmonella still was decreased with the OSPP. And um, they're still, when you transfect, increase more. So it's more complex, as always, in science than originally thought. Um, and that still is a bit confusing. OK, let's go back to the gallbladder and see what's going on with this by 2 mutant. So SSCL, when you take a mutant, one of the things we saw 
but it's hard to see, is that salmonella is really elongated in these sense. It's hard to see, but there's really long red things in here. Um, in the SSEL mutant, there's, there's some phenotype going on in terms of the salmonella shape. But what's really neat, and let's get back to lipid droplets, when you take a mutation SSEL, you got a gazillion lipid droplets. Look at the, all these things here. So here's wild type. You can see a few lipid droplets. There's none in uninfected cells in the gallbladder. But look at all the lipid droplets in here. Phenomenal amounts of lipid droplet formation in here when you knock out the SSEL. So it seems to be that um, SSEL is, has a function kind of suppressing formation of too many of these lipid droplets. And when you knock it out, you get way more than you do in the wild type. And you can see some spectacular events in the SSAL mutant. So here's uninfected gallbladders, um, wild-type infected, has a few lipid droplets. But look what happens in the SSAL mutant. Profound effects in the cell. You can also stain the lipid droplets with this thing called bodipi, which is a lipid stain. And you can see that in the mutant, you get a lot more of these lipid droplet staining here. You can even extract the lipids in these things and just measure them. And you can see that in the SSEL mutant, there's just way more. You can just see these things here. There's just a lot more lipids in here. And you can measure the, the lipids being produced here. And you can see there's huge amounts of lipids in this SSEL mutant. So whatever's going on, SSEL seems to be suppressing the formation of these lipid droplets. And, um, and when you take out SSEL, still infected with salmonella, these, the gallbladders just go crazy in terms of lipid droplet formation. So if, if that's the case, now I told you that it was known that SSCL had deubiquitinase activity, so it basically gets rid of ubiquitin. So we basically put a point mutation in this activity and see if that had any effect on the cells. And it turns out that, um, that the lipid droplet accumulation depends on the deubiquitinase activity. And you can see when we took an SSCL mutant to put in a wild type SSCL, we suppressed lipid droplet formation. Yet if you put in a point mutant in the deubiquitinase, you still get a lot of these lipid droplets here. So that argues that this enzymatic activity of whatever it's deubiquitinating is key in this um, lipid, goblet, um, lipid droplet formation. And this is also shown here with this Bodipi stain. Um, here's um, Salmonella the SSEL mutant with a wild type SSEL. You get a few lipid droplets here, but if you take the, um, the point mutant, you get a lot more, meaning you need the deubiquinase to suppress the lipid droplet formation. So that kind of brings me to, to the end of what I want to tell you about salmonella. We've gone through many different aspects of it, but what I want to do is sort of bring up some of the areas that are different from the way we think about it and um, what these uh, effects are and how they contribute to salmonella. So, so one of the things I try to drive home is depending on where salmonella is inside the intestinal tract or in the liver and the spleen, you get very, very different diseases. And that argues you've probably got different virulence factors and different bacterial factors doing this. Um, in mice, um, normal mice, you get the systemic type disease. And I've, I've talked before while I've been over here this month on the effect of antibiotics in the microbiota. If you change the microbiota, you get a whole different disease. You get gastroenteritis. I showed you some data that the long-term infection of salmonella can cause this fibrosis type effect. And this has now turned out to be a very nice model for studying fibrosis as a model of complication of Crohn's disease, as well as just studying long-term um, inflammatory type infections. I spent a fair bit of time telling you about this gallbladder because I think this is an important aspect that really hadn't been studied before about how it contributes to the whole shedding of, of typhi. And the neat thing is it gives you a whole different way of looking at how salmonella interacts with different epithelial cells, being basolateral instead of apical. And um, we know that this life in a gallbladder plays a key role in the whole shedding and dissemination of typhoid fever. And now we're starting to get actual um, answers of how it hangs out inside the gallbladder and what it might be doing. So there's no doubt salmonella interactions with the host are complex. There's an awful lot of these effectors doing an awful lot of different things. And unfortunately, there's an awful lot of things we just don't know yet. And so you know, we anticipate the years to come. We'll have lots more things to do because we think we're getting close to the end of identifying new type 3 effectors. We think we've got the list pretty much there. But each effector really takes a whole, as I showed you with SSEL, takes a whole bunch of effort to try and track down what that one particular molecule is doing inside these cells. And so there's lots of things we have to do yet in terms of understanding, really, at a molecular level, how salmonella interfaces with its host. So this is a picture of the lab, one of the retreats. Um, um, and um, obviously, I've mentioned many people's work. Um, I think I can 
detail them here a, a little bit more and the various people involved in um, the um, SPI2 work, the early SPI2 work in the gastrointestine, Guntram heavily involved in the fibrosis model and the gallbladder, Alan Alfredo and, and some other um, friends were involved in this. And then Michelle did all the SPI2 mutants and Siggy and Ellen have done the whole um, SPI2 effectors and also the whole effect of, of, of the effect on the lipid droplets. And for those of you who haven't been to Vancouver, this is Vancouver, it's on the west coast of Canada. Um, UBC, the university, is actually out on the peninsula right here. Um, this is where the university is, this is the downtown area. And oh, it's just out of the picture where the Stanley Cup finals are going to be played. There's an arena right here. And um, there's a nice park here, et cetera. And this is Vancouver Island up here. So with that, I say thank you very much. <laughs>